hello, hello, students. I hope you're ready for our lab today on momentum. We finished up yesterday talking about momentum, so you know a little bit about momentum. So let's keep the momentum going and get right to our lab, shall we? Uh, but first, who can tell me what momentum is equal to. I hope you said mass times velocity. Momentum is equal to mass times velocity. That is correct. And today we are going to be working on the momentum lab. And our problem of our lab today on page 34 is how does velocity affect the momentum of a moving vehicle? Now, think back to yesterday when we were using the example of the elephant and the mouse. And I think it was evident to you that the more massive an object, the more momentum it has. That is a relationship between mass and momentum. But today's lab is asking a slightly different question. Now, don't answer this out loud, but let's read it again together. How does the velocity affect the momentum of a moving vehicle? So think about the key words here, velocity and momentum. The question is asking you, Basically, well, if the velocity increases, how is that going to affect momentum, if at all? Will an increase in velocity increase the momentum? Will the velocity increasing decrease the momentum? Will a change in velocity have no effect on the momentum? Uh, you might be even able to think of other options, but I want you to take a moment to write a hypothesis based on your knowledge currently. What do you think the answer to this problem is? How does the velocity affect the momentum of a moving vehicle? I gave you some options there, but think about your hypothesis and take a moment and write it down now. Okay, we're back here. And again, the, the problem that you're trying to answer with today's lab is how does velocity affect the momentum of a moving vehicle? Now, normally in the lab, we would have teams of people trying to answer this problem. We'd have a timekeeper, a driver, and a recorder in order to perform this lab activity. But today, I'm going to multitask and I am going to perform the function of all of these titles. So on your lab page, you should see your data table which looks like this. And uh, I'm gonna summarize the procedures for us here today, and I'm going to collect the data, and you are gonna do some calculations, and you are gonna make a conclusion today, and you are gonna make that conclusion based on a graph that you draw yourself. So I'll be performing the lab, I'll be collecting the data and providing that information for you, but you're gonna do all the rest. So here we go. Uh, let me first explain what it is we're going to be doing. We have a little vehicle. This is the vehicle that we're going to test. And we're going to take the mass of this vehicle in a moment. In fact, well, you know, why don't, I, why don't we go to the lab right now? And uh, I'll show you what we're going to be doing here. So here's our vehicle. We're going to determine the mass of this vehicle. In fact, let's do it right now, and you can write down your data. So I'm going to turn on our digital balance, wait for the zeros to zero out, and I'm going to determine the mass of our vehicle that's going to be riding for us, and we're going to drive it. And it looks like the mass 
of our vehicle is 25 grams. So in your data table, I'd like you to write down next to mass 25G for grams, 25 grams. So that is the mass of our vehicle. And our vehicle is gonna be riding along a track four times at four different velocities, which is what we're gonna have to figure out. But I have already measured the distance of our track using a ruler. And the distance is two meters, two M for two meters. So write that down in your data table as well. And while you're writing that down, I'm gonna tell you that the mass of the car and the distance of the track are going to remain constant. They are not variables. They are not going to change. We're gonna use the same car and we're gonna use the same distance of the track each time, okay? So they will remain the same for each of our trials. Now, another thing that we're going to need is a stopwatch. And I'm going to record the times that our car travels the same distance, but under four different conditions. And it's those conditions I'd like to take you to now as I perform this experiment for you. So let's head out of our little virtual lab and go back to our PowerPoint and just point out to you that the mass of your vehicle, 25 grams, the distance, two meters. These numbers will remain the same throughout our experiment. Now to save us some time today, <laughs> to save us some time today, I have already done this lab activity, although I'm gonna show you the video of it in a moment. So I've done it three times for each trial and I'm gonna be giving you the average times after I show you the video. So to find the average time, I've taken the three times, added them together and divided by three, because there are three times in each trial. Now I will tell you that during each of these four trials, what I've done is adjusted the height of the track to make the initial height higher with each subsequent trial. Now, what effect do you think that might have on the speed of the vehicle? Let me try and illustrate it for you. Trial one, the track is angled very slightly. Trial two, it's angled a little bit more. And by the time you get to trial four, it's angled a lot what would you expect to be the result from trial one through trial four if trial one has a shallow slope and trial four has a very steep slope? What effect do you think that might have on the velocity going from trial one to trial four? Did you say increase or get faster? Well, let's find out if your prediction is correct or not. So let's go to our video of our actual lab activity. I'm gonna show you what I did and then I'll help you fill in the data. So everybody ready? Here we go. It's gonna go sequentially from trial one to trial four. So here we go. Setting up for trial one on the opposite side of the track, which is two meters long, I've set up the end of the track 10 centimeters above the table and watch. And I am keeping the time and I'll tell you that time in just a little while as I write it down. And now we're going to trial number two. Trial number two, notice I'm increasing the track 10 centimeters. So now the beginning of the track is 20 centimeters high. I'm going to get the vehicle once again to bring it to the top of the track. I'm keeping track of the time from the start to the end. And here it goes. Whee! 
did you notice anything about the velocity, the relative velocity from trial one? Do you think it went faster or slower the second time? Call it out. All right, here we're getting ready for trial three. Trial three, it's up another 10 centimeters, so we're at a total height of 30 centimeters at this point in time. We're getting the car, setting the car back up at the top, and watch as I time. Woo! Do you think that was faster or slower than the first trial? What do you think? Call it out. All right, we'll see if the numbers prove you're right. And now here is the fourth and final trial. It's up to 40 centimeters tall at the beginning. I'm keeping track of the time. Let's see how fast it goes this time. Whew. Seemed pretty quick to me. Do you think it went faster or slower the first time, the second time, the third time, to the fourth time? Did you happen to notice a trend in the movement of the car as the beginning of the car went higher. All right, let's get to our data now, shall we? Let's fill in some data. I collected the data. I already averaged the times for you. And here is what I got and you can record in your book. So trial one, the average time it took for the car to get from the start to the finish, two seconds, 2.0 seconds. Write that down. Trial two. Trial two. The time for trial two, the average time for trial two was 1.5 seconds. And you can see for yourself, trial three, 1.5 zero seconds, and finally trial four, 0 0.5 seconds. So as you're looking at these numbers, what happens to the time from trial one to trial four? Raise your hand, raise your hand, who can tell me? What happens from trial one to trial four in terms of the time? That's good, the time gets shorter, it happens faster. It travels the same distance in a smaller amount of time. All right, well, our next step is to now calculate the velocity. So let's do that. Let's calculate the velocity. Now the velocity is going down the track, that's the direction. But raise your hand if you can tell us all, remind us all, how do you calculate velocity of a moving object? And remember, it's the same as speed. It just has a given direction, and our direction is down the track. So how, raise your hand, how do you calculate velocity? Nice job. It's distance divided by time. Well, we have the distance here, and the distance is the same for all four trials. The distance doesn't change. It's two meters. So it's gonna be two divided by our average time for each of the four trials and that is going to give us the velocity for all four trials. Pause me for a moment so that you can calculate the velocity for all four trials now. All right, hopefully you are able to do the mathematics and you got the following velocities. Trial one, the velocity is 1.0, and don't forget your units, meters per second. The velocity for trial two, 1.3 meters per 
second. The velocity for trial three, 1.0 meters per second. Oh, I'm sorry, I was distracted there. I'm reading the wrong number. Uh, I hope I read that previous one correct, did I? Trial two, the velocity, 1.3 meters per second. The trial three, velocity, 2.0 meters per second. And finally, trial four, the velocity is 4.0 meters per second. So I believe you have that information now correct in your data table. And you now have my focus again. All right, the next step is to calculate momentum. Well, you told me at the beginning of the period how you calculate momentum. And somebody, again, raise your hand and tell me, how do you calculate momentum? Raise your hand. Let me know. Hopefully, you said momentum is equal to mass times velocity. In fact, it's right in your book there. I gave it to you. Momentum equals mass times velocity velocity. Well, the mass of your vehicle, the little race car here, is a constant. It didn't change. It was 25 grams for all four trials. So you're going to take the mass, 25 grams, and multiply its velocity, which was the variable. So the velocity did change. You had a velocity of 1, 1.3, 1.2, and finally 4.0. I'm going to give you a minute so you can pause me. And at your desks, I want you to calculate the momentum of the vehicle at all four trials, multiplying the mass times each velocity. Take a moment and do that now. All right, I'm back. And I hope you got the same numbers I got, or maybe I should say I hope I got the same numbers you got. So here we go. The momentum for trial one, 25. And what's up with all these letters? Well, the units for momentum in this case are gram meters per second. 25 gram meters per second because we multiplied mass times velocity. Mass is measured in grams. Velocity is measured in meters per second. So our units are gram meters per second. Now, if that confuses you, don't worry about it. Scientists love lots of units. So we're just going to use those units and accept it for now. The number is 25. Our second trial, 32.5 gram meters per second. But make sure you write those units down, please. Trial three. Our momentum was 50 gram meters per second. And finally, for trial four, our momentum was 100 gram meters per second. Hopefully, our numbers agree with one another. But we're not finished yet. Because now we're going to be creating a graph using our data. And scientists love to use graphs because graphs are a wonderful visual representation of our data. And we can interpret graphs very quickly and easily just by looking at them. So you're going to have lots of practice here uh, this marking period making graphs. And typically we'll be making line graphs and we'll be interpreting those graphs. So if you look over at the next page, page 35, you see I've given you the basic foundation to a graph, but you are going to have to fill it in first by giving it a title up top. And you might want to call it uh, the momentum lab or velocity versus momentum. You can come up with a creative title yourself, but definitely write a title at the top of any lab you make making sure that the title relates to the topic. Next, you're going to have to set up your graph using your x-axis and the y-axis. Now, since uh, 
velocity is the variable that you are controlling and changing. You are using velocity along the x-axis here. We're trying to see if changing the velocity has any impact on the momentum. So momentum will be on the y-axis. Now, on the graph in your book, you will notice there are darker lines and lighter lines. I want you to label the darker lines. On the x-axis, you're going to label those darker lines going from 0 to 5. And the reason for that is if you look at your data, if you look at your data on the previous page, your velocity is within a range of 1 to 4. So we're giving a little buffer on either side, 0 to 5. So label your x-axis 0 to 5 and uh, put the title there for the x-axis velocity in meters per second. Over on the y-axis, again, you can refer to your data to help you with your data distribution on the y-axis. But I'd like you to label the darker lines starting from zero and going up to 125 gram meters per second. And you're labeling each dark line with a value of 25. So take a moment and label your graph as I've helped illustrate here for you. All right, I'm back. And now we need to plot your four dots. And I accidentally gave you the first one there. Oops. But you're going to plot your dots. How do you plot your dots? Well, it's like playing a game of Battleship. Uh, hopefully you have experience from math class plotting XY coordinates. That's what you're going to do. But I want you to remember from your data, you're looking at velocity and momentum. Velocity and momentum. You're not going to be plotting the time, the distance, or the mass. You're only looking at velocity and momentum. So when you plot your dots on the graph, look at the value for velocity and what is its corresponding value for momentum. Plot a dot on the graph. I'm going to give you some time to plot the first dot. Hopefully, you plotted your dot where I have plotted my dot because your first data point that you're plotting, the velocity is 1 and the momentum is 25. That's the approximate location of where the dot should be on your graph. Take a few more minutes and plot the remaining three data points, the dots on your graph. All right, I'm back. Hopefully you have plotted your dots so that they look like this. You should have a series of four dots on your graph. Now, I said you're constructing a line graph. If you have a ruler, great. If not, you can just eyeball it here. I know we're uh, not in the laboratory, so be creative in uh, using a straight edge to draw a line. But what I'd like you to do is draw a line through those four dots. Do that now, and you should come up with a line that looks something like this. Hopefully yours is even better than mine. All right, big whoop de doo What does this mean? Well, we can look at this graph, and we might be able to interpret it right away, but I want to give you a couple other scenarios first before we actually write a conclusion. And the other scenarios are this. It is possible that when you plotted your data, you might have ended up with a straight horizontal line, a flat line. If your data resulted in a flat horizontal line, then you could conclude that there was no relationship between velocity and momentum. Because if the blue line here illustrates you the reality, then no matter what the velocity is, the momentum would have stayed the same. No relationship. Or you could have produced a straight vertical line like this one. And if 
this was the line that your graph created, then you could also conclude that there is no relationship between velocity and momentum. Because as momentum changed, the velocity didn't change. It just stayed the same. And that obviously wasn't the case. But your line was angled. Your line was diagonal here. Now, it could have been a diagonal up or it could have been a diagonal going down. In either case, if you produce a line graph with a diagonal line, then you can write a conclusion saying that there is a relationship between these two variables, no matter what they are. In our case, it's velocity and momentum. There is a relationship between velocity and momentum. But more than that relationship, you want to answer, well, what is the relationship? All right, we can see that there's a relationship here between velocity and momentum, but what is it? Your conclusion should answer that second part of the question. So what is it? How can you answer that? Well, look at the shape of your line. As velocity increases, what happens to the momentum? Does it increase, decrease, or stay the same? Hopefully you said increase. So in your conclusion, you could write, based on your observations, there is a relationship between velocity and momentum. As velocity increases, momentum increases as well. That would be a great example, conclusion, for you to write. So, as the car increased its velocity, its momentum increased as well. In other words, the faster a car goes, the harder it is to stop that car. Which is why when you're traveling on a highway, going a faster velocity, you should leave more room in front of you. You shouldn't tailgate because the laws of physics dictate that the faster you are traveling, the harder it is for you to stop. It is much more difficult for you to stop at a higher rate of speed than a lower rate of speed. A little bit of science knowledge here can actually save your life one day. Don't tailgate on the highway, and I hope others don't tailgate you. But this is how accidents can happen when people don't understand and apply the laws of physics to life. So I hope you've got a good conclusion from today's lab, and let me just give you one final reminder study for tomorrow's quiz. And at this time, I will say bye-bye.